Ishi of two worlds. With 120 different native languages, and each language representing a distinct culture, California had the greatest cultural diversity of anywhere on the continent. Such diversity in a similarly sized geographic area is known only in two other places on Earth, the Sudan and New Guinea. The most well-known native Californian is Ishi of the Yahi tribe of the Yana Nation. The Yahi, like hundreds of other peoples across the continent, were victims of America's own final solution, a euphemism for genocide. Ishii spent 40 of his 50-some years living in hiding to avoid such massacres as the one he survived as a little boy when he was about 10 years old. Only 12 other Yahi escaped, the last people of the once flourishing Yahi. For three full years before walking out of the hills, Ishii lived in total solitude, the last living speaker of his language. His surviving band of Yahi had held out against impossible odds longer than any other native tribe on the continent. U.S. Army mandates, vigilantes, miners, and ordinary citizens hunted native people like animals to extinction. They massacred men, women, children, and infants with Anglo-Saxon efficiency. Thousands of women and children were illegally abducted and forcibly removed from ancient land holdings, if not murdered and sold as slaves. Native women were raped and forced into prostitution with no legal representation. Bounty hunters were paid per scalp with government money. Over the years, government policy pursued a systematic eradication of all Native people. By 1900, no eradication Aboriginal people could support their traditional lifestyle anywhere on the continent. Ishii wandered out of the wilderness near Orville, California in 1911. He was in pitiful condition, alone, starved, emaciated, and in mourning. He probably expected to be killed. Not knowing what else to do, the authorities put him in jail, where he was eventually rescued by Thomas Waterman, Saxon Saxon Pope and Dr. Alfred Kruber, who had recently formed the second department of anthropology at the University of California in Berkeley. Kruber was the first graduate of America's first anthropology department founded at Columbia University by Franz Boas. Boas wanted to document native culture thinking it would disappear completely. Boas formulated and advocated the four-field approach to anthropology still in use today that includes the study of culture, language, human physical variation, and archaeology to be of equal importance for the scientific understanding of humanity. Kroeber took Ishii to live at the University Museum where he was curator. He hired linguists to try to understand his language and elicit information about how his people had lived in hiding, hunting antelope, elk, and deer, fishing salmon, and gathering acorns. The Yahi had no agriculture. They were hunters and gatherers and an example of an ancient life way that all human beings utilized for over 90% of our species' existence. How did Ishii see us? Saxon Pope wrote, Ishii looked upon us as sophisticated children, smart but not wise. We knew many things, but much of our knowledge is false. He knew nature, which is always true. He was kind and self-restrained, and although everything had been taken from him, he had no bitterness in his heart. Kroeber was the director of the newly formed San Francisco Museum of Anthropology, which was to be Ishii's home for the remaining five years of his life. It was here that Ishii was employed as a janitor for $25 a month, sweeping around installations and artifacts, and he reconstructed native-like huts, like those in which he lived in the remote wilderness of Deer Creek. Ishii became a living museum exhibit, something like a sideshow freak. His presence drew gigantic crowds to see the real living noble savage or wild man. Ishii was born at the beginning of the 1860s, at a time when California's native people were being systematically exterminated by gold miners and settlers. The Yana people, of which the Yahi are the southernmost branch, were at one time about 1,500 individuals, but quickly decreased with the discovery of gold in 1848, which brought its tidal wave of 49ers. During his lifetime, Ishii's people were massacred and persecuted, and their numbers declined until he alone survived. His remnant people lived in hiding during the day and moved about only at night. Whites thought that they had gone extinct. 
but for several decades the little group had remained. They lived in ingeniously camouflaged huts. They could travel long distance, distances, hopping from stone to stone to avoid leaving footprints. Every footprint they left they covered with leaves. Their paths ran beneath the chaparral and they went on all fours. They broke no branches and cut no wood. They spoke softly around small fires without smoke. And for a few more years, the Yahi stories were heard in whispers, and their collective memory was shared by a tiny group. By 1908, only Ishii, his old mother, an old man, and a young woman remained. But when land survivors accidentally came upon their camp, the old man and young woman drowned while trying to flee. The old mother was found wrapped in a blanket. She was taken by the whites, but died soon after. Now Ishii was totally alone. For three more years, he would wander around the landscape that once was the homeland of his people. No one could speak his language anymore. When Ishii died of tuberculosis, a disease he was exposed to in the museum in San Francisco, with his death, his language, his culture, his way of life, which had existed for millennia, went extinct. Ishii died knowing that Americans had committed a total genocide of his people and culture, yet he never showed any sign of hatred. When he died, he simply said, You stay. I go. Upon hearing of Ishii's death, Alfred Kruber wrote from Europe, We propose to stand by our friend. If there is any talk of the interest of science, then say for me that science can go to hell. But in the end, Ishii's brain was removed and preserved and sent to the Smithsonian in Washington. Can the crimes committed against Native Americans be forgiven? What does it mean for modern Americans to live on land that was stolen and its owners murdered or displaced? Native people exist today, but how have they changed? How can or should we as modern Americans